Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Tackle Shop Live. What up, Scott Lockoff? YouTube user in the house, Breezy Flyer, what's up? DP, how are you doing? The next day, yeah, topic tonight. You told me I'm your little butter. We're all dealing with it right now. Uh, Carlisle, how are you, buddy? Warren Cottrell's well, here. I know what I feel. Please tell Kurt me I love this world. How are you, buddy? You F. Santanello, how are you, you Or no, Santangelo, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, brother. Dale Fogel, how are you? Jim Saban. Go, 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 Bez. What's up, buddy? Yeah, man, dirty water, spinnerbait fight, that's been epic, you better believe it. I'm glad for you, brother. Bob Austin, how are you, pal? Danny Paust. Yeah, Joseph Cascarino. <laughs> Tim McSee. Love you too, go, go. Good to see you, pal. Craig Hershey, how are you doing? You know just what I feel. What's going on? Yeah. You make me smile when I think of you. If I yell down when I am blue. I can't get enough. Oh, the way it is. What's up, Conway? Wow, wow, wow. We got a great show for you tonight. Appreciate everybody stopping in for another edition of Tackle Shop Live. My name is Mike Acord. This is George Acord. Cameraman Nick is feeling under the weather, so he's not here tonight. So we are going to do the show ourselves, which I think we can manage possibly. I'll be jumping back and forth on the camera as we do our different spots on the show here. So if you don't see me sometimes, I'm on the camera. I'm doing Nick's job. Not as good as him, but I'll try. <laughs> But, uh, man, what good to see everybody. Tammy, Tammy's here. How are you, Tammy? Alan uh, Kobach, how are you, pal? Yeah. Kenny Clemmer, what's up, man? Listen, uh, we got a great show for you tonight. You know it's been raining everywhere around the country, uh, and the water is muddier than all get out. Some places uh, it's really super muddy. Other places um, it's not... Uh, not horrible, but it's still some dirty water. So we're going to talk about fishing dirty water tonight, uh, which goes along with our weather. So uh, that's going to be a that's going to be a good time. Uh, I, I do want to tell you guys, don't forget SummerSlam tournament coming up. Our sign in is going to start April the 19th, which is next Friday. That's the start of our sign in. And for you guys that don't really know what it's all about. Uh, Summer Slam tournament has been going on now for a long time, 15 years. And uh, we hold it on the Upper Bay, the Chesapeake Bay, um, down in uh, the state of Maryland. And it is a tournament that we wanted to do to try to get more people involved with tournament fishing. And to do that, we felt like we needed to do something special. So this is a tournament that everybody's a winner. And how's that work? Well, the deal is that the entry fee is a purchase of Shimano, G Loomis, Jackal, and Power Pro. Um, and you have to buy $250 per boat between the, the two guys or two people in the boat. You can split that up. It's $250. And at the end of the tournament, if you have a bad day or whatever, don't catch any fish, guess what? You get to keep all your tackle you bought. And, um, Basically, you won the $250 back. So um, that's the deal. It's something that we we wanted to do. We wanted to get new blood into tournament fishing, and we wanted people to feel like they weren't just donators and they felt like, you know, uh, uh, they, they, that they can't compete or whatever. But it's funny. A lot of people that get in this tournament that haven't tournament fished before are surprised when they go to the scales and they where they end up. We've had guys that never fished tournament before end up in the top five we had um you know a lot of top 10 finishes with guys that never fished down there or ever uh fished a tournament for so everybody has the opportunity of winning and this year we're giving out over eight thousand dollars in cash 
uh, to the winners. It's a great, unbelievable payout. And uh, that payout could go up depending on how many boats we get. Thing is, you got to get in early. Um, we have a 200 boat cutoff this year, and it's got, we're gonna have, we have to stick to that. That's our maximum amount. Um, we cheated a couple other years, you know, getting guys in at 150. We, we bump it over a little bit, but this year where we are got to stick to the 200 boats. So make sure you get in early, make sure you sign up. All of the registration stuff will be on sfttackle.com, As you can see on the screen there, um, you can go on there and you can check out the, the page that, uh, we have set up for you it has all the information on there. You can buy online and uh, fill out your application and send it in, or you can come into the shop here, fill out your application, bring it in, and we'll get you guys all signed up for the tournament. Very exciting time. It's a great time. It's a great, a lot of great camaraderie. We have a great weigh-in, and we do a great tackle toss, and we do all kinds of cool prizes. We're going to give away uh, some great rod and reel combos from Shimano and G. Loomis um that you guys can check out we're going to give away tackle uh packs that we talk about today sure yeah we always do we always do so everybody everybody's going to get you know a little giveaway of uh of some freebie stuff so that's going to be cool but anyway coming up put it on your calendar april 19th and the tournament is may the 19th down at the anchor marine in the upper bay on the northeast river northeast maryland I uh, hope you guys will get in. I hope you guys will fish the tournament. It is an absolute blast, and I promise you, you'll have a good time. Um, what else is going on? Well, uh, I got a chance to fish a tournament over the weekend on Saturday uh, at Blue Marsh. Congratulations to all the guys that caught the fish. They they brought in some really nice bags there uh, under tough conditions. I took my daughter Zoe with me. Uh, man, what a trooper absolutely impressed the hell out of me we had 30 mile an hour winds all day long and it was blowing like crazy uh the water was muddy it was cold and she stuck it out like a trooper she fished all day long never stopped a total grinder george a total freaking grinder she's a beast she is a beast i was i was really really impressed with her uh we didn't do that well uh but we had a fantastic time uh i will tell you that but uh and our uncle george said something and she was here the other day and uncle george said ah mike finished last or something like that and she chopped she uh uh chirped up real quick and said we didn't finish last there was guys that left and went home a lot earlier in, during the day and she was right 100 percent, 100 percent. so we stuck it out all day long fish right up to the last minute had a great time on the water uh really tough conditions muddy water and that kind of spawned the idea of fishing the dirty water and what it takes to catch fish um, in the dirty water, especially cold, dirty water, which is really difficult. So we're going to get into that tonight, big time. Uh, but first we always like to do a little section that we like called tackle talk. Yeah, baby. Uh, Great conversation for us is talking about tackle. We love tackle, as you well know, with our tackle shop here. We love messing with tackle. We love talking about tackle. George, what is going on? What do you have new? What do you have unique? What do you have you want to talk about tackle wise? Oh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, I just feel like I'm off my medication tonight because I am literally. <laughs> all over the place. Oh yeah. I, I mean, I need like Wait, that's I don't know what kind of medication you take for that, but whatever it is, I need some. Yeah. Uh because I just kind of went, you know, helter skelter with some new, some old, and some stuff that's trending. Mm. You know, I got my ear to the track at all times. So yeah, as you well know. Yeah, I know you do. Um I know you do. So I want to start off. With um the I'm gonna get the Cadillac out here. We're gonna start off with the Cadillac. Uh, I have the new mm. Shimano Twin Power spinning reel, the freshwater version, the F E as in Edward. And I'm here to tell you, you know, all twin powers are spectacular. You know, the twin power 
for those of you who aren't familiar with it, because it's probably not the best known reel in the Shimano lineup. Uh, the Twin Power is an extremely close relative of the Stella. Quite a few of the same um, technologies are in play here as are on Stella. Um, so it's always been kind of like viewed that way as you're getting a, a very Stella-like reel at uh, uh, not a Stella-like price. And they are they're, they're spectacular. They're absolutely spectacular. You know, this is the latest generation, the E, the E generation. Um, so you're going to have... Here, here at the shop, we, we actually stock this reel in four sizes. We start at the 2,500, and then we do the 3,000. Okay. And then we do the 4,000, and then we do the 5,000. I don't have any 4,000s in stock. Um, I do have a 5,000. Which, you know, in most bass fishing situations... This is not going to play. You know, we do a lot of saltwater fishing here at the shop. We do a lot of striper fishing. A lot of our customers are, you know, using spinning tackle for their light tackle saltwater. So we always go up into the saltwater sizes. Um, but if you like throwing big baits on big rods, you know, the cool thing about the 5,000 is it has the same body as the 4,000. So you're not getting into a big, big reel. But focusing on, you know, the bass, the bass sizes, which, you know, you're 25 and you're three. Um, and there's a couple interesting things here, Mike. For example, the 2500 has a five to one gear ratio. Okay, now most of the, the 2500s in Shimano's lineup have a six two to one gear ratio. But this reel was designed with the five to one gear ratio taking up 30 inches of line per crank as a power reel, a torque, a power finesse, a torque, you know, a little more torque. Uh, you're still taking in 30 inches of line per crank, which is good, but you got more power. So for those of you, for example, I'm going to give you a, a what for. For those of you that fish a lot of small crankbaits on spinning tackle, which a lot of people do, this lower torqueier gear ratio, 30 inches of line per crank, that's you all day long. Um, for people fishing various finesse techniques, you know, drop shots, shaky heads, Tamiki rigging, I can go on and on. Um, you're probably going to live in the 3,000 space. So same body size as the 2,500, a little deeper spool, not much, just a little deeper a little more line capacity. You know, all these reels feature the one-piece bail. This is actually a machine bail wire. Very, very strong. Um, but you're at a 6.4 to 1 gear ratio, taking up 37 of inches of line per crank, which is great for picking up slack for a hook set, recovering from a hook set. Um, just a great re ratio for, you know, contact fishing like that. Um, and, you know, like I was saying, this reel shares a ton of technology with Stella. So I want you to pay attention to the oscillation of the spool. That's how slow the pace of that stroke is. Okay? Now, just for um, context... Here is a uh, Vanford. Okay. Traditional oscillation. All right, here's the twin power. Super slow oscillation. Um, and not for nothing, the smoothness of this reel, it's, it's, it's Stella-like. Um, so your pinion gear, your pinion gear is 
and this is not unique to this reel, but your pinion gear is is bound, is supported on both ends um, with a bearing, okay? So your pinion gear, when you turn the handle, you mesh, you know, a gear spinning this way with a pinion gear, which, which drives the spool. So the drive gear faces this way, the pinion gear faces this way, and the two mesh up. Helical cut teeth, micro module teeth, so small, so like three, four teeth meshed in with that helical cut gear. Those teeth are made wider to get more contact, and they have a snappy little turn for that. It's called Infinity X Cross, okay, which simply means you got a lot more bite if you will, a lot more contact surface, a lot less wear, that mesh type feel. I mean, you got to feel how smooth this reel is. I don't know if you can feel it. Listen, put your ear up to your computer like this. You ready? Everybody there? I'm telling you, smooth, isn't it? Um, so as I was saying, um, we've, we've got a lot of those same Stella features. You know, we obviously have the fin, the anti-twist fin, which we broke down for you on Stratic. That is a dynamite little piece of technology for your fluorocarbon guys. Um, you mono guys, it's going to really reduce that, that twist that is induced by your lure. Okay? Um, and anyways, tremendous uh, water... Um, I don't want to use the word proof because somebody will manage to get water in there. Super superior high level of water resistance. I mean, basically the water would have to like flood up underneath the rotor and then between the rotor and the body, which is a minute space, it would have to like go over a a, a barrier and then fill up a trough but before the second barrier and then get into the spool shaft and then somehow work its way down through the friction-free seal into the reel. But if all that happens, you're having a really wet fishing day or you were swimming. And not to worry, every bearing in this reel is anti-rust. They're coated. The the Even the stainless that's used in those bearings is the highest level of anti-rust stainless, and then the coating. These things look like they're smoke black color, like a Teflon coating. They don't rust. The drag is a, like, cross-carbon stack. I mean, very little wear on that drag, super smooth. Anyways, suffice it to say, we started with the Cadillac. The Twin Power FE, you know, and not, not for nothing, the Twin Power FD, was, I mean, just spectacular. So for them to upgrade that, starting at $449. So it is a little little pricey. But, you know, if you're that, if you're that guy that likes to get one, one, or gal that likes to get one really awesome combo every once in a while, this might be your reel. Um, and not for nothing, if you like the Ds, we do have a few of those left that we are closing out at a ridiculously reduced price. You can, you know, you can, it's not on our website. Um, there's just not that many of them, but you can call or stop in if you're a, if you are a, fa a fan of the Twin Power FD, which is also a spectacular reel. But I want to start with that, Mike. Um, and now I'm going to go to some baits. Because I know deep down inside, every one of you is looking to buy a new bait or two tonight. Uh, I know I am. And I can't. I don't even have any spots to put them anymore. But I'm going to find one. Because the new Respect Series Mega Bass has hit the street. It's on the shelf here at SFT. Uh, this month's color is called Blueback Chartreuse Candy. And as you might imagine, it's got a blue back. It's got a transparent chartreuse side. It's got an orange belly. Oh, man. 
can't it's almost like a candy it's almost like a candy finish on that blue i mean this thing is bad to the bone the red eyes um that's the 110 this is the 110 junior it is not available in plus 1 for the i know i know there's a bunch of you out there that jump on the plus ones we always sell out of them first the 110 plus 1 Nope. The 110 Junior plus one. Nope. But we do have a good number of these two sizes in stock. And for those of you who uh, are big fans of the Giant Dog X, we have a small a quantity of these. Uh, respect series, color, you know, blue back chartreuse candy in the Giant Dog X. One of the best walking baits ever made. Um, and, you know, there is a, I'll tell you, there is a, I was overlooking at our little specialty wall of Mega Bass today. There is a ton of previous model respect series in the Giant Dog X. I guess y'all don't like them as much as I thought you liked them. But there's not a lot of each model, but there's a lot of models. Um, and with top water season coming up, hmm. So we got that. That, of course, is also not on our website. They just go so fast, it's not worth building the page. Um, you can call us up on those or stop by. And, um, yeah, for all you Mega Bass fans out there, we got you covered, right? That's what we do. All right. Moving right along. I am going to move into a jig that was released at least a year ago, if not two, from Jackal that is getting a bunch of play. Um, and it's called the B-Crawl. And it's actually a swim jig that they have made for fishing in primarily wood cover. It's a very snag-resistant swim jig. And it's it's getting a lot of play here this this season. It's got a very flat bottomed head. Okay, skips really well. It's got a two pronged weed guard, so you can you can adjust those out to whatever level of um, spread you want on them. They're plenty long enough. If you want to trim them back, you can a little bit. Uh, it's got a great keeper system. For those of you who know, that conical keeper system is money. Um, and I think, if you can see it, I don't know if I'm the guy for this job. They have the weight stamped on the on the keeper, in case you forget. And they do claim that this has tungsten is a tungsten head. So I haven't tested that, but it's nine ninety nine, so it very well could be. Great hook, four ot hook, plenty of juice there for a good fish. But the B crawl, and it's 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 a it's a swim jig that was specifically designed to fish really good in wood, brush piles, laydowns, different type of wood. But obviously, that's going to swim grass real nice, too. A uh, bunch of cool colors. You know, this is obviously is the black and blue, a different take on it. There's, you name it. You name it on shad colors. There's a ton of them. So that's your B-crawl starting at $9.99. Well, actually, it's not starting at $9.99. It is $9.99. Quarter and three eighths, and a pile of colors, all kinds of crazy shad colors and bait fish colors. You know that that whole JDM thing. Um, for those of you looking for, speaking of jackal, for those of you looking for, um, I always forget the name of this little top water that they make. Um, Bear with me. Let me think about that for a second while I go on here. I had it on the tip of my tongue. 
I can never remember it. Um, but anyways, I'm going to think about that. I'll get, I'll circle back on that. Um, and I wanted to, I'll tell you something else I've been getting a lot of questions about. Uh, not just me, but in general here in the shop, you know, we get a lot of technical questions, you know, and we do our best to study, um, our products. I mean, we, don't, we can't remember everything. It's a lot, but one of the things we get asked about a lot, and one of the things we sell a lot of is gold label, cigar, fluorocarbon leader. Now, don't get me wrong. We sell a ton of blue label, the original blue label um, fluorocarbon leader. Now, gold label is their premium uh, version of blue label, which... I don't know. I always thought Blue Label was premium. Blue Label's proven itself from trout fishing to tuna fishing. Okay? So you can't... There's there's nothing that's not premium about Blue Label, but they use words like premium and what have you. What's interesting about Gold Label is they also promote it as its smaller diameter, which is true to an extent. You know, if you look at the chart side by side, you'll find out like the 6 and the 8. Or same diameter. So, you know, they might want to say the smaller diameter in most cases. Because once you get into the heavier pound tests, 15 is one of our number one selling sizes. That's a thinner line, straight up, than Blue Label. It's also a, uh, they call it a dual structure fluorocarbon. So, you know, it's kind of was explained to me like, like, like a copolymer line where they blend a, a soft mono with a abrasive resistant mono, and they try to get maximum abrasion resistance that they can have with, you know, a, a, a reduced amount of memory. Okay, so you'll know, you know, if you if you're blue label guys, fifteen to twenty, you got a little more memory, but you're only using it for leader. This is this is definitely lower memory. Uh you know, from 10 pound or, or 12 pound test up, it's smaller diameter and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the dual structure fluorocarbon. It ties a great knot. We, we sell a bunch of it. We get a lot of comments on it. I get asked a lot of questions about it because it's obviously a price of your line. It starts at my notes here. It starts at 1799. That's for 25 yards. So, but it is leader. You know, you're not filling your reel with it. Obviously, um, you know, if you're putting 15-pound fluorocarbon on a casting rod, you're probably only putting about five feet on there, four feet on there. You can get a lot, you can get a lot of leaders out of that pack and be fishing primo leader the whole time. And your leaders will last longer. Um, so that's just to break that gold down, just to kind of fill in the blanks. It, it just things just stick in my head, you know, from talking to people all the time. Um, and then last but not least. Because we are in that time of the year where we're fishing a, a bunch of jigs. Um, I want to talk about the G-Man balling out jig from Buckeye. You know, this time of year, we start selling a ton of ball jigs. Um, and by ball jig, what do we mean? It's got a ball head. Okay. This is a jig style that was born... Um, on the rivers in the southeast, particularly the Coosa River. And it's a very effective jig style. You got a ball head. You have a, not a flat eye, but you do have a 60-degree eye. It's an inline eye. You, It's a finesse cut, okay? Short top, um, long on the bottom. All right, it's not tied, it's banded. Quality hook, beautiful, beautiful jig. Absolutely beautiful jig. Um, and a fish catching son of a gun. I'm telling you, the ball head style jig is straight up deadly style. We stock several ball head styles here at the shop, but the balling out jig from Buckeye is definitely a favorite. It's got your traditional keeper. Single barb, so it's going to hold your plastic trailer pretty well. 
And, you know, again, it's coming into jig season. These are just things that are rolling around in my, my cranium. Another thing I wanted to mention to you, back in stock, they've been out for a long time, some of the best lure covers that you can use on your rods or your baits. The Daiwa, and they're clear. Okay, they come in a ton of sizes. Um, it's called the DVEC um, Tactical View Lure Cover. This is a large, so just so you can get a relationship of the size. This is a large. You're going to use that in a you know a, a bait like a you know a bigger a bigger jerk bait, um, bigger top water. But they have something very interesting, and for all you Alabama rig guys, they make this in an extra large. And there's no better way to store your Alabama rig. You can keep this on the rod or off the rod. Um, if you have a little spot where you store your rigs at home, it has a little hanger on it where you can put it on your peg. You can kind of compress them in here. Zip them up. Your swim baits aren't getting all dirty and nasty. Your A-rig isn't tangling the other 27 rods that you have in your rod locker. And it's behaving a lot nicer when you're moving from spot to spot. You riders, you co-anglers who are bringing A-rigs with you, put this around your A-rig on your rod. Extra large DVEC, best A-rig toter. Um, I also carry a bunch of my swim baits in these, um, and I really like them. Now, one of the greatest tackle mines in the Mid-Atlantic region <laughs> um, that I know is a, is a, is a uh, Chesapeake Bay guy by the name of Paul Batters, and Paul has saved my bacon. <laughs> by mentioning that the bait that I can never remember the name of, which, by the way, I've probably caught more fish on it than most people watching this show. Uh, yeah. It's not like I'm a stranger to this thing, but I have a metal block, and it's called the riser bait. And you basically can't get them unless, you know, you're willing to do things that are unspeakable on this program. Um, however, I was checking with Jackal today. My rep was in here today, and he was kind enough to hear it, hear out my rant and do some investigative research. And, I mean, while I didn't get a solid answer, um, we do have basically the amount that you could fit on a container ship on order. And um, I don't know, maybe it's stuck in the sand somewhere, but they are getting closer. So it's going to happen, and we will let you all know. I know you. we're coming up. We're coming up on that riser bait season. You know, for those of you who don't know the riser bait, um, last year, I believe it was in the Elite Series event on Hartwell, the riser bait was being used as a forward-facing sonar bait to catch fish schooling on herring. Not on top. Now, the riser bait, when you cast it out, it sinks. But as soon as you start reeling it, it pops up to the surface. Well, these guys being elite anglers with the emphasis on the word elite, uh, they were letting it sink down and riser bait fishing it above those fish. Yeah. Now, mysteriously. That was cool. And unbeknownst to, you know, me, or Berkeley has a bait that came out this year called the Kresh, which is a bigger riser bait, but the lip doesn't move on it. Um, yeah, that was a little sarcastic. No problem. <laughs> but um, they're, they're coming, okay? I don't know when they're going to be here. We can't get a firm answer, but I, I know I know they've been out of stock for probably a year and a half for the most part. We might have gotten maybe 30 or 40 of them in, in the last year and a half, but pretty much out of stock. So, fingers crossed. Uh, let me check the old notepad here and see where we're going. Twin Power FE. Respect Series Blueback Candy. <laughs> um, E-Crawl Swim Baits, Swim Jigs from Jackal. Tactical View colors, Covers, Lure Covers from Daiwa. 
gold label from Seagar. Mm -hmm. And it. last but not least, G-Man's balling out jig from Buckeye. And that will be your tackle talk for this week. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> I, I uh, respect series color, man. That thing's that thing's super. Uh, you know, um, bright bright chartreuse colors. You know how they are with that blue back. That's like a staple color in everything else, crankbait wise. Could be like yeah, a, it ain't no joke. That could be a a, a serious player. Uh, we're gonna find out. Yeah, well, we probably won't find out, but somebody's gonna find out. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, there you have it. Um, the other thing that we, that we like to talk about is some tournament talk. And today we, I came in and Caitlin had, uh, the MLF up on the TV set. And I was like, what is going on with you? We have to watch the Bassmasters today. Well, they canceled today. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you, if you agree with them, whatever, if you don't agree with them, then you're, then you're whatever I, you know, I just think that the the cancellation um, situation has gotten out of control. I, I mean, yeah, if somebody's going to come on here and say, oh, you're not down there having to put your boat out on the lake and fish in 30-mile-an-hour winds. No, I'm not. But if I was an elite angler, I would have been lobbying too, okay? First of all, there's eight lakes. I think you can fish seven of them. Uh, most of them aren't that big. You, okay, so you're not... The pictures that they show on Bassmaster.com of the raging sea of, you know, Harris Lake, um, <laughs> it's not where you're fishing, okay? Uh, these guys are elite pros. They, they will run their boats in far, far worse conditions this year. They already have run their boats in far, far worse conditions this year at Toledo Bend. Yeah. I mean, like, no yeah. joke. Yeah. No joke. Big water. Big time. This was a... Nothing compared to that. So, you know, the canceling of the tournament day for these guys that have got it all on the line is not cool. Okay? It's not cool. They did their work. They got prepared. This is not like a regular tournament. This is like your career in some cases might be in the balance or it could be just keeping the bus going or it could be keeping the momentum rolling or whatever. But I'm pretty sure that most of them didn't want the day off, okay? And I just feel like that the canceling of tournaments, now I get it on the local level. Look, we have a lot of tournaments on big water around here. We fish, for those of you not from this area, we fish Chesapeake Bay a lot. And it's huge. And depending on wind direction and tide direction, and the same goes for the Potomac, it gets pretty gnarly and pretty dangerous. And, you know, in the past, and, and I'm going to, I'm just going to say this in the past, uh, 10 to 12 years, cancella cancellations of a day or a tournament on the local level up into the regional level are quite common. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with, insurance companies and stipulations you know when when you're on a tidal body of water like this they 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 use what they call um the various levels of storm warnings and they have what's called a small craft advisory they have like a gale advisory you might want to pay attention to the gale when they say gale uh you know and then you have the tide that will cross that water at some point and you, you do have some extremely treacherous conditions. I mean, where it's, where it's really dangerous. Um, so, yeah. You know, when you're canceling on the local and regional level, 
it the reason those cancel cancellations have increased is because of the insurance companies and the lawyers. And you know what? Local and regional and club tournaments do not have tournament organizations that run them. Now, you might belong to the federation, but guess what? The federation's going to tell you guidelines on that. How do I know this? Because I knew tournament directors that were subject to this, okay? So I get that, but this is a whole different game here. This is, this is like, you know, canceling the Eagles game because it snowed too much. Okay, it ain't gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So you know, something to think mm -hmm. about. I mean, I'm certainly not bitching at Bass. No, but I'm just saying, you it know, wasn't dangerous down there, was it? Hell no. You know, and they're mm. like, well, you know, lightning, thunderstorms, hail possible. Yeah, well, it's Florida. I got news for you when it comes to the lightning and the thunderstorm and the hell part. Uh, pretty much every day it's possible. And you know what fishermen down there do? They deal with it. They go to safe places. They park their boat, maybe under a boathouse, maybe along a shoreline, whatever. They know what they're doing. This is what they do. Um. And by no means did I take a poll. I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't literally did not talk to a single mm -mm. elite series pro about this. And if I had, I wouldn't even have voiced their opinion. Yeah. I would never say so and so told me this and so and so told me that, or I heard this or I heard that. I'm just telling you, as a lifetime tournament angler and knowing what those guys, this is not like a game. They wanted to fish today. Okay. And so now what happens is they're going to fish Friday and Saturday full field. They're going to fish Sunday 50 cut. They're going to fish championship Monday. Oh, but next week's tournament starts on Monday. Thursday. Practice starts on Monday. So not only did we cancel today, but we also canceled over one third of their practice next week. So now you're like impending, impeding their livelihood two weeks in a row. So, I mean, just think about it. This is not cool. Yeah. And I, that's a little bit of a rant. I don't mean to be like that. It's just, you know, kind of pisses me off. Well, you know, I see it. Uh, Paul Batters, you got to think about the marshals, camera guys. Camera guys are pros too, Paul. Uh, matter of fact, they're kind of famous for what they do. Marshals, I mean, I'm sure there's some of them that didn't sign up for this, but you're right. You you make a valid point there. You go out and you hurt a marshal, and you're going to have a problem, which, again, goes back to the insurance thing, mm -hmm. which, again, probably had to play with this. And, again, I'm not, like, calling bass out. I mean, we're not fishing boat docks here. I'm just saying... This is what I noticed. Yeah. And, uh, you know. Um, so we're going to start watching that tomorrow, which is really super exciting. And we'll see how another day off. Remember, they were off Wednesday. We'll see how two days off totally changes everything. You know, the wind, the wind blew out a ton of water because these shallow water guys, you know, grass, mud and mud and mud in Florida is no bueno. Yeah, terrible. Um, I don't so know if that, there's any sight fishing going on down there. Or what? Of course there is. How far the spawns along down Mostly there? Mostly over, but there's enough sight fish for some of the pros. Yeah. Now, listen. It's going to be interesting, now that they did this, for us to see massive adjustments made on the fly by these guys. Yeah. So I'm really going to be, I'm really going to be dialed in. Yeah. Can't wait. That's exciting. Can't wait. That's exciting, but we did get a chance to watch the MLF all day today. On, yeah. Uh, on. Uh, oh yeah. What were they at Pickwick? No, not Pickwick. Uh, Dale Hollow. Dale Hollow. Legendary <clears throat> Dale Hollow. Yeah, boy, did it did it, did it ever put out? Holy crap! I was watching uh, the guy that's leading the tournament. Man, he was whacking four pounders left and right. He had three, four sevens. Well, Britt Myers is leading it at the end of Group A. Yeah, he's the guy that had those four. Uh, four, three, four sevens. That'll work. Yeah. He's yeah. got 140 pounds and eight ounces. Yeah. 
in two days. You know, he's catching big fish. He caught a big largemouth. I saw, you know, the only the stuff I could see because I was working hard today. Don't have a lot of time to watch TV. I got you. But I was working hard, and every time I looked up, the guy was landing a four pounder. So you made it look easy, though. Yeah. The way you did it, the All way right. you went around it, really, you really made it look like it was easy. Yeah. <laughs> Very impressive. It's not, not real technical, but uh, ninth place is <laughs> Keith Poche with 79 12. Yeah. So you got from ninth place to first place is what 60 pounds yeah that's quite the that's huge. quite the spread and they go at zero out don't they yeah so that doesn't really mean anything now it's meaningless top 10 what what really means is ninth and tenth adrian avena's tenth yeah he he just snuck in there it was he did. real tight and then he held on and then he was and he was all worried there and 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 uh and then they announced it and he you know that was that was a neat little moment there. i think it's cool we yeah. got adrian avena and keith poche going to the knockout round um, what's up ryan bauman congratulations buddy I, I don't know if you ended up in second or first I, I had to leave my boat was floating away uh on the lake so i had to run after that and um couldn't get another parking spot so we just we just pulled out but congratulations i saw you had a nice bag of fish yeah my swim bait didn't work out real well only threw it for a little bit that was your mistake i threw i mean i threw it long enough to know you got to commit I did commit to it, but I, I threw it a lot, a lot more than I should have, honestly. Spoken like a I don't know. I was, well, I was ready right for one of them big old smallies to come up and chew on that thing. Well, you know. <clears throat> second. Oh, second place, Ryan. Well, that was, that was awesome. That was a tough tournament, man. And, um, you know, absolutely uh, brutal conditions with the wind and, of course, the muddy water. Uh, that was very impressive, brother, to to be able to come in with a uh, big old sixteen pounds. That was that was pretty awesome. You know, um, that sounds great, and that tournament was tough, but this one at Dale Hollow wasn't. No, no, they're um, smashing them, and it was cool because, you know, you had your forward facing guys, of which Britt Myers was one of them. Uh, Drew Gill was another one, 125 pounds, two ounces. Um, and then you had a whole bunch of guys that were just fishing. They were fishing the bank. Mm -hmm. They were old school fishing, you know, any old piece of wood. Yeah. Well, I saw that. That was, that's fun. And they were also looking and, you know, as the day went on, a whole bunch of fish started moving up into the spawning type position. And so you had sight fishing, you had, you know, old school, just bank fishing, you had forward facing guys, you had, you know, all of that represented it and represented in that top 10. Yeah. Um, so Dale hollow is a, is alive and well, and it's, it, it is a mountain lake. It is a cool looking lake. Never fished it. Always wanted to fish it. Because of the history and the lore, mm. that's where the world record smallmouth was caught. Yeah, that's where the silver buddies from. Yep, you know that's where Billy Westmoreland's from. Uh, Everybody was really impressed with the lake. I mean, uh, it's you, awesome looking. You, you talked to the guys, and they were like, I, you know, this really impresses the number of fish they were catching and how they were catching them. They had all different ways of catching them. They really, they really enjoyed it today. I, I'll tell you what else was cool. The 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 world class level of sandbagging that they dis that they exhibited during practice, I got to tell you, pro fishermen are uh, in all of sport are some of the greatest sandbaggers that you'll ever meet, <laughs> and it kind of lends itself to sandbagging if you think about it. I yeah. mean, you know, race car drivers can't really sandbag. Cause you're trying to qualify. Yeah. You're not, you're not leaving anything on the, on the field. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, like wrestlers can't really sandbag. You're not really like holding back on your opponent and letting them get tired or something. Golfers. Golfers can't sandbag. I mean, you can't like give up a couple strokes just to give a false sense of weakness. That's there's just no point in sandbagging bass fishermen and pre fishing can sandbag. Yeah. When they come into the ramp, because nobody's with them all day. 
Yeah. There's no, there's no recorded record of this. Yeah. So when they come into the ramp and they get their buddies are talking to them or, or members of the press, you know, are checking them at the ramp. You know, I love those pieces. They do uh doc talk pieces where they check them at the ramp and they interview them. Yeah. I mean, it's just sandbagging. It's, 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 it's amazing. I love it. It's part of the game. You know, it's like I love playing poker. It's like playing poker. And you can sandbag in poker now. Um, but the first day of the tournament, we find out. Yeah. Sandbagging. Yeah. So pretty cool tournament. Um, yeah. gonna have to definitely tune in a little <clears throat> bit tomorrow as group B finishes up to get in that coveted top ten spots to make the knockout round. Um on Saturday. Mm. So Saturday, we're going to have knockout round. We're going to have uh, day two of the elite series tournament. So tomorrow's going to be for us, for us armchair quarterbacks, tomorrow's going to be a good day. Cause we're going to have to see how the Bassmaster elites deal with rapidly changing conditions. A lot of dirty water. We're going to have to see how, Group B fares on Dale Hollow, which is pretty much a foregone conclusion that they're just going to go out there and drop the hammer on them. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. Mm. So that's what's going on in the uh, top tiers of tournament fishing in your world, as reported Yeah, by your boys, George and Mike. I am excited for uh, Great De Palma tomorrow. Hopefully, he does really well. I know. Oh. He's, I know he's going to catch them. Oh, catch the big giants, Greggy. If you're watching, I'll tell you who else is is having a a momentum in the elite. Um, and I and I think it's a combination of like a mental game momentum, uh, like like spiritually lined up momentum with fishing. And that's Mike Iconelli. Mike Iconelli could be dangerous on this tournament because he's very well versed in Florida. Mm -hmm. He's in a really good place game wise in his head. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a veteran amongst veterans of many, many years, but he freaking loves the game. Yep. And he's going to Florida where he's really good. He really is good in Florida. If you look at his history in Florida, he's pretty deadly down there with a swimming worm. Yeah. Um, you know, and a wacky rig and things of that nature, which really play well in Florida. Now, my prediction is going to be this because oh, I know. Here we go. I, yep. I'm going to break it down. Here for we you. go. I'm going to break it down <laughs> for you. Okay. Yeah. So. I am going to predict that a lot of these fish are post spawn and those shell bars offshore and those brush piles offshore are going to play big time. Okay. We've seen it going back five, six, seven years now. Mm -hmm. They're going to play big time. Um, also, the ability to spread out on this body of water. Now, keep in mind, a lot of these lakes have changed in the last year. High, dirty water has choked out a lot of grass. Other lakes have flourished. So you're going to see, my prediction, you're going to see a lot more guys going to the other end of the chain, which is a very uh, time-consuming process. Mm. And we all saw what happens when you run those canals on plane. Yeah. yeah. You tend to run people over. Yeah. And the elites ain't going to play like that because that's <clears throat> instant disqualification. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's going to be. Are there locks on there they have to lock through? Oh, yeah. Is there? Yeah. Yeah. You've got various rivers and canals and locks that connect these lakes. Yeah. Um, seven of the eight are connected. Little bitty Yale Lake is not. That's out of play. Oh. Um, all the rest are in play. Griffin, Dora, Apaca. Harris, man, I had a good run going there. Um, Griffin, mm. hello. Mm. Um, so 
this tournament, I think, is going to be really interesting. Uh, again, unless they were sandbagging, mm, the practice period was brutal. Yeah. And now we've had two days off. Yeah. So a lot of that practice is moot. Yep. Uh, so this is going to be, this is must-see TV. It's going to be a grinder, isn't it? Grinder tournament? Probably, based upon the practice, unless they were just straight-up bullshitting us. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sandbagging. <laughs> But we're going to watch that tomorrow, and we're going to learn from that. Yeah. We're going to pick up some stuff. But in the meantime, we are going to talk a little technique. It's one of the things we really like to do. You know, if we don't have a guest, then we like to kind of pick a topic, and we like to kind of, you know, just kind of throw a mixture of our slant and a little conventional wisdom. But a lot of it's based on our experiences. It's not like the book of bass. It's 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 things we've picked up over, you know, 40 years of chasing these little buggers around. Um, and it's fun. Yeah. And so we're gonna our topic tonight we're gonna talk about is some dirty water bassing. Yeah. Um, and you know, if you look at our bassin map, okay, <clears throat> um, you know, down in Florida, where we're at right now, we have the majority of the spawn over. Mm -hmm. A few still spawning, obviously. And then as you move up the uh, country and you get into the southeast, uh, you're 50-50. And then when you come up the coast and you get into the mid-Atlantic region, you're like 30-70. 30% spawn, 70% not spawn. And when you get up here, it's like 2080. You go a little bit further north, it's zero. Mm -hmm. 100. Um, and that those bands kind of carry across the country. So, you know, we're in that, we're in that all phases. Um, but dirty water, you know, and 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 the thing about the spawn that Mike and I talk about a lot. It's the most difficult time of the year to catch fish. There's a few individuals in every neck of the woods that are freaking awesome at it. And I'm mm -hmm. not talking about sight fishing and plucking fish off the beds. I'm talking about, uh, Johnny nine to five who gets to fish on Saturday and or Sunday with the occasional three-day weekend thrown in for a trip with the boys or a club tournament or a BFL, um, once or twice a year, a week-long trip to experience getting dialed in and staying with them for all week. So what do I mean by that? In the spring, you know, it's a lot of luck involved with the weather because you can have, like we're having right now, spectacular conditions for temperature but terrible conditions for water quality yeah and then we could now it's not going to happen here but we could get slammed with a major league cold front like we did less than a month ago okay because less than a month ago around our part of the world we had uh our that 20 percent of spawn i talked about occurred because we had a long, almost a week, things got right, and then we had a freaking kick butt cold front with very cold temperatures, wind, rain, flooding, nasty for a week. So, you know, if, if that occurs with your time off, it's very difficult to fish in the spring, and that is what we mean by that. You know, if you can fish for, you know, three, four, five days, and get in that cycle. Yeah, you're going to disagree with that statement, but uh, for the most part, spring is volatile. So you need to be able to catch them when they're backed off, when they're pulling up in dirty water and clear water and all of the above. Right? Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, I'm just going to throw this out there. Um, I am 
I'm less focused on water temperature now than I have ever been in my life. And a lot of that comes from what I've learned on forward-facing sonar. Now, it's pretty damn important to the spawning period, and it's pretty damn important to the, the waves of fish. And by waves of fish, I mean groups of fish that, you know, pull up on, let's say, a point stage. We call it staging. You know, they pull up, they're feeding on a point, there's bait fish present. I'm just saying point. Could be a hump, could be a edge of a flat, whatever. <clears throat> and it's pretty unique because the time from when they go from there to the bed to back again isn't that long. It can literally be a day. Like, you can go from catching fish and then you stop catching fish and they were good fish, and they were grouped up, they were staged up, and then they're gone. They're up on the bank cruising. And, you know, they can basically get on a bed, spawn, and by the next morning, the female's gone. That's, that's kind of a time frame for you. So, you know, you intersecting that window. Now, the nice thing is they don't all do that at the same exact time frame. So it's a constant meandering. Until some massive cold front comes in and kicks well, you right in the coronies. I mean, that's where the temperature thing comes in. You know, it, 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 there's a lot of factors go on with, um, you know, dirty water and springtime fishing and the spawn and all that stuff. And the temperature is something that we all kind of pay attention to. Um, but we're finding that, like George said, you know, we're finding that it, it, it's, it's it's looked at different because of forward facing now but um you know you're dealing with dirty water and a couple things that i noticed with fish and dirty water um and a, an event where the dirty water kind of is starting and happening is you know you 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 have a a, a a precipitation george and you got a nice rain and break it, it down mike it, cantori and it comes in you know and it pours and dumps and the, and the water comes up and um usually after your your storm your rainstorm the next couple of days it's blowing like a son of a bitch you know no that's when your front comes through you know your back side of your front comes through it blows like a son of a gun when when wind will switch around to the yeah. north so a couple of things happen you know yeah it might it might have been a warm rain it might have been a cold rain you know that's something to consider uh but the wind with that dirty water, it will, st you know, not just dirty water, but with the water, it stirs it up. So, you know, um, you're thinking, man, you know, um, last week the water temperature was in, uh, you know, uh, 50s. And now all of a sudden I get out there and the water's 48, 45, 47, whatever. And, um, you know, the water has risen and uh the water's gotten dirty and and all the things that tell us you know what to do follow the fish to the bank but the temperature kind of messes with that if it's if it cools it off sometimes they they don't move up as quick you know they'll stage it they'll stage out deeper and stay out in those spots where they're more comfortable and uh so you got to be really careful for that and and you can follow water too quickly you can you can um you know, missed the call because it, the temperature didn't rise like it was supposed to, or uh, the 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 it got cold, it got colder, it got stirred up, um, that kind of stuff. Well, you know, and 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 what's interesting is, you know, we always talk about using the wind, fishing the windy bank. That's not what we do in the spawn. Yeah, we're not fishing on the windy bank. We're not fishing where the wind's hitting the bank because it's stirring things up. It's already dirty. Then the wave action is making it worse. Those fish do not spawn in those situations. They're looking for protection from the wind. So keep in mind that that old adage of, you know, getting it, getting using that wind, using that wind to your advantage, getting getting on those wind blown banks, wind blown points, wind blown this, wind blown that. Not so much when they're spawning. Um. We're looking for a protected area. Uh, we're not necessarily looking for like a big major cove, although a lot of fish will move into those. Um, I mean, they'll they'll be fish just randomly spawning along banks that have little flats on them. 
That's just what they do. Um, and yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, you know, the old adage of, you know, start at the main lake point and then go to the secondary point and see where the fish are in, in the migration back. That's pre-spawn stuff, actual spawning stuff. I mean, they could be spawning in the very back of that sucker or anywhere in there spread out. You know, they're not like sunfish. They're not clustered on top of each other. They're spread out. There's some, there's some, there's some space. Now, now you get in a grass situation where you have, you know, basically what we would call a grass bed. Um, that's a little bit different. You're going to get a bigger concentration of spawning fish in a smaller area, particularly um, if there's some good quality bottom associated with that grass. Because grass will grow in, in muck. Grass will also grow on good quality bottom. The other thing that's nice about grass with a dirty water event, grass is a filter. So... You know, if you know, once the water has been dirty for a couple of days, everybody's cool with it, right? Stay cool. Well, that's that's be imp- cool. That's important. That's important to know. I mean, you know, uh, with a with a dirty water uh, event, the first part of that dirty water event is very difficult. Well, it, you got You got to go in your early stages. There, <clears throat> messes. You want to start. You want to start looking for. Areas, if if you're on a grass body of water, you want to start looking for grass in protected areas because they're going to filter out the dirt mm. first. You also want to look for run-ins. Yeah. You want to look for those pipes, those culverts, those little streams that are flowing in. The, those streams are the first streams to flood, meaning they're small. So when the rain starts hammering, they go crazy out of their banks. They, they're blowing in the lake, and they are they are the devil. They're bad, but they also run off as quick as they built up. And what will happen is is they'll start running that clean water in, and that clean water will kind of filter down that shoreline, particularly if there's a little current. Maybe they're generating some water on the lake, and they're creating a little current. They're gonna that water's gonna pull itself down the bank. That water's not gonna mix with the other water. There's gonna be a clear little band right against the bank, and then there's gonna be the dirty band. They don't blend together. And that is that's like that's like uh I mean secret. That's we can't even talk about that in certain areas. So fishing, fishing dirty water. You're you're saying you're looking for the clean, clear water wherever you think you can find clear water. Fresh, freshly dirty water. Yeah, we go from nice. I'm fishing this weekend to Thursday. It starts raining. And you're like can't have nothing nice. <laughs> Saturday you're going fishing. Everything's all hogged up. Yeah, I'm gonna maximize my time. I'm yeah. going to go for, I'm going to look for clean run-ins. I'm going to look for grass that's filtering. I'm going to look for protected pockets. So if I had a big, and what do I mean by that? Thanks for asking. Mm. If I had a big northwest wind, right, I'm going to go on the west side, mm. and I'm going to look for pockets that that bank protected. Mm-hmm. Now, yes, the water did get dirty, but there was no wave action there, so it's going to be less dirty. Mm-hmm. Plus, I'm going to get farther away from the source of the dirt. If I'm fishing a lake, the incoming flows is where my dirty water is coming from. So by yep. getting away from those areas, <clears throat> I'm going to get some cleaner water. Absolutely. Now, on a small body of water, yeah, you might be in trouble. You know, we fish some beautiful lakes you and I that are small. Well, yeah. And I, when they get dirty, the whole freaking lake gets dirty. Right? Yeah, and and and, it, and they do. You're not really uh, getting away from it there, but, but there's still little er, spots. Early in early in the er, early in the event for for instance on Saturday when we were when we were fishing, when we got there in the morning, uh the lake was uh, where we launched which was down by the dam was was it wasn't dirt it wasn't dirty, it wasn't cleaner that it wasn't as clean as it usually is. It had just a fuzz hair stain on it, but you could definitely see a mud line. If you looked up lake, you could see the mud line. 
And that mud line was coming all day long. It's working at you. So, you know, yeah, of course, we're going to start in a clear, clean water and bounce around in the clean water and we're looking yeah. at clean water. And you had gonna, options. We absolutely had options. But as the day went on, that mud line kept working its way down and down and down. And by the end of the day, the whole entire lake ended up. And because that's a small body of water, it was not a big body of water. Right. So, you know, you had a situation there that was unique. Now, the other thing that I never even thought about, but but you said it, you know, I wonder if the upper end of that lake started to clean off because of some of those creeks running in. Uh, and I'm super glad that you brought that up yeah. because my next thing that I wanted to point out was, you know, if this happens on your regular body of water, you know, this is not the time to put your boat in and go fish your routine. Okay. Cause your routine's probably wiped out. This is the time to say what Mike just said. I wonder if the upper end of this lake has some clean water in it. Well, this is the day you're going to burn some gas. Mm -hmm. It's worth your investment of time. I know you only have that one day, but it's worth your investment of time to go to that area and look. You know, if you spend an hour looking around in the morning for the right water, that might set you up for the next seven hours of your day. Right? Yeah. Instead of spending two hours fishing your normal routine and then coming to the you know, the crystal clear realization of, oh, man, we should have went and looked for some clear water. Yeah, you should have two hours ago. Um, so, you know, make sure you have a little gas in the tank. You know, you're not going to fish your same old lake your same old way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now, you know, we talked about the run-ins. We talk about the, the little culvert pipes, those little sneaky little ditches that run in, trout streams, what have you. I know I have... Mm -hmm. There's a couple in my mind right now that, I mean, there's one I've never seen another boat at in my life, and I've caught some big fish there. Uh, and it's only good, only good under these circumstances. It's not, it's not good the rest of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, how do we catch them in muddy water or dirty water? during the spawn cycle, okay? So, you know, you got to find them. So you got to look for them. You want to do that with some moving baits, okay? Um, would you agree with that? Absolutely. So how are you going to start that off? What? Uh, so we're, we're talking about the spawn, so the temperature is obviously a little bit warmer. You're in the 50s. Or 60s. Yeah. You're uh, mid, mid to upper 50s and, and, and all the way up 60s. through all the way up through the 60s. Yeah. Yep. And remember, you know, our new education mm. that we've received with forward facing sonar, all everything we ever thought about cranking mm -hmm. is all wrong. Mm. You know, the cold water aspect. Mm. Like we you and I would have never ever crank baited in the mid to upper 30s. Ever. And we probably caught more fish doing that this year from the mid to upper thirties to now mm -hmm. than ever. Yeah. So, you know, we have to uh under evaluate what we learned about water temperature. Yeah. Um, I hate to be the one to tell you that. Yeah. But you uh I'm gonna go back here and grab a bait that I wanted to show some some people and uh talk about some moving techniques that we like to use in this dirty water. Yeah. To find them. Yeah, well, you know, and and before before I get right to that, I got you got to understand that the river fishing, you know, for you guys that are river fishermen is different than the lake thing. You know, the river the river thing because you have the current um you know the it cleans out differently, you know, and those run-ins happen a lot quicker and better and faster. And those uh, creek mouths, you know, get cleaner quicker than they do in a, in a lake because it's a much slower process. So, you know, something that got dirty on Wednesday and Thursday, by the time you get there on Saturday, the, those creeks are running clean, you know, big time. And all that water is getting pulled out. That clean water is getting pulled out of those creeks because there's always good current on the main lake. So, 
it's it's a lot easier on a river, a shallow river, uh, or any river really that has a good current to find these cleaner uh spots these little cleaner water run-ins uh, the pipes like george is talking about that that pull water down the, the bank and you get that clean little strip of water down the bank uh there's a lot of those um that are that are more a lot more definitive on a river system and there's a lot more of them on a river system because you got a lot more uh you know uh building around the banks you know up and down the banks you you know you have towns and you got uh you know, a lot of industry along the riverbanks that have these pipes that flow in, these uh, clean water creeks that come in, they all running into the river. So there's a lot of opportunity for you to find these clean, protected uh, creek mouse. And uh, you can go in there and fish and have uh, great success quicker than in a lake situation where it takes a lot longer for that water to pool from the backs of those coves and those backs of those creek run-ins takes a lot longer for that water to work its way out. Uh, so, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, the differences between the currents in the river and the currents in a, in a lake. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, when we're in, in that muddy water and you want to throw some, some moving baits, um, I still like to throw, um, a crankbait. You know, I like to throw a crankbait. I like to throw a red crankbait uh and and cover a lot of water with it and those fish will you know those fish will definitely react to it even in dirty water um and we're like george says work your way back from the from the main points to the secondaries and going back in there to see where these fish are on the spawn and how fast and far along they are on the spawn so i like that moving bait a lot yeah chatter bait is definitely a player um you know depending on the water clarity you know, I'm going to go anywhere from a full-on red, you know, the fire crawl. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can do, I've seen, I've seen where the orange blade fire crawl just rocks hard over the regular fire crawl, but that's usually not a, con a concession, but I have seen it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, black and blue is one of my favorite dirty <laughs> water colors. Yeah. And then uh, when I'm still in a, a stained water, but it's not like real real muddy um one of my sleeper colors is green pumpkin with a fire crawl trailer um and what's nice about a chatter bait and dirty water is you can slow it down um you can yo-yo it you know you can you're putting out a ton of vibration that's that's the that's the key i think is the vibration not only the color but you ton got of that vibration. Ex extra vibration yep. for those fish to pick up on and i like a bulkier trailer you know a crawl style trailer or a boot foot swim bait style trailer you know where i'm where i'm i'm adding to that whole uh thump and profile right and it's a great way to search that those spawning areas for a bite or two that can tell you okay i need to slow down here a little bit there might be a concentration of fish here um another Another uh, color chatter bait that is really good to keep on hand is just old school chartreuse and white. That is such an overlooked color these days with all the designer colors. It really is. Yeah, old school chartreuse and white. And if the water's real dirty, I love to put a chartreuse trailer on it. A chartreuse crawl or a chartreuse swim bait with a paddle tail. Um, have had a lot of success using that as a search bait. And a lot of times if you're fishing grass during the spawn, you, you know, you have a, a much bigger group of fish and you have fish that are spawning, done spawning, um, not ready to spawn. And they're all kind of in the same general vicinity. Now mm -hmm. there'll be little, there'll be little features in there that you can key in on, but for the most part, you know, you can do a lot of work with that chatterbait you can you can you can fish you know expand the area try to get a feel for how big of an area are these fish focused on um you can again you can slow down you can uh you can yo-yo very very effective and very very effective in those circumstances <laughs> you know you're not going to change your setup you know if you're a glass rod guy or a or a 
carbon rod guy, whatever. You're not going to change that. You're not going to change your line, whatever your line choice is. It's just the bait colors. And they're and they're and they're probably not as critical. Um unless you can get them to eat that red. That red, that red's pretty like polarizing color. Um, mm -hmm. another another bait that's excellent for searching and not just hard bottom and not just hard cover, because you know, if you don't have grass or vegetation, you know, fish love to spawn around wood. They like a lay down tree where they can get like a limb coming over top of them or they are a trunk that they can spawn up against or in deeper water, they'll spawn on top of a stump. Um, mm -hmm. They can spawn on the sunny side of a dock piling, whatever. But um, they, they like that wood. So, you know, another bait that, that has been tremendous exploration bait, for these conditions, especially in that dirtier water that we're that we're focused on today, is the square bill. And one of the things I like to do is size up. And one of my secret colors is what they call wicked, mm. which is black with a little bit of blue barring on the side. And that's a 2.5. Um, Wicked Fire Tiger, which is black with some chartreuse barring on the side. I think they're interchangeable. You know, uh, Six Cents does a lot of nice black, black body crankbaits. Black is a very underutilized square bill color in the spring, um, particularly in dirty water. And it's a very effective color. So make sure you have your reds. Mm -hmm. You know, which is which is Mike's all about. Yeah, your chartreuse black back, which is a standard staple item, and make sure you have some black. Yeah, don't black, forget the old school fire tiger, straight up fire. Black tiger. wicked, <clears throat> like them black ones. I like wicked man. Yeah, fire tiger, obviously fire tiger, old yeah. school fire tiger, old school fire tiger. Um, uh, but what's nice about the 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 square bill? And here's something that a lot of people still don't do because it's aggravating is crank grass. You know, a great way to crank dirty water grass um, and, you know, grass that you can't see, grass that you're seeing on your on your graph. So, you know, where your edge is. Um, is with a crankbait. And, you know, you can adjust your crankbaits running depth based on line. A lot of times in the shallow water, square bill environment and grass, we're going to be cranking with 20 pound line. It's just going to, it's just going to take some dive off that bait. And, you know, you want that bait to get up in that grass and you want to pop it free. Okay. So you're looking for efficiency of movement, right? Oh yeah. Um, deadly technique for big fish in the spawning phase when you're searching. Okay. Um, and what's cool is, is if you have a good success finding a group of fish is you can then slow down and rework that area. Not so much on a old school bank, right? Cause they don't really group up like that, but on grass, uh, or if you get into like a, uh, an area where fish are favoring to spawn on a hardcover situation. You know, if it's a bigger area, there's going to be a lot more fish there. It's just a space thing. Um, you know, assuming you got bit a couple times. Slowing down. Now. Slowing down. Slowing down. Slowing down. <clears throat> and, you know, remember, we're talking dirty water here, so we want a, we want a profile, right? And that is, again, you know, this sounds like an ad for Buckeye, but that this is the time and the conditions where the mop jig absolutely rules. A big rubber mop jig with a big crawl style trailer or a big full size chunk trailer. Something that's going to put off a big profile, some vibration and allow you to pick apart wood 
Yeah. Grass. Now, keep in mind, the water's dirty, okay? This isn't going to be like clean water jigging. But you've kind of defined your area. Now you're going to pick it apart. Maybe it's a maybe it's a cove that you got bit twice on with your chatterbait, and then you went down through there and you didn't get bit. You're going to turn around. You're going to come back up through there, flipping this jig around. You know, anything that looks good or just blind casting it because the water's too dirty, or you might see a little something that leads to a little something, or you might find a little stream coming in that puts a little bit of clarity in the water, you know, to give it that where you can see in there a little bit. And that mop jig is money. I mean, all jigs are, but that mop jig in those situations in the spring, it was made for that world. That is another. That's what this was made for. Another really good bait, George, for for that is a is a good creature bait. Absolutely. You know. <clears throat> Absolutely. You know, I like a, a brush hog or a baby brush hog, flipping that this time of year. Absolutely. You know? But the real the real key is is, you know, when you're coming back through that stuff and you're working that stuff, man, really really pick it apart. You know, make those casts that are you know, get you back up underneath that log nice, you know, where you think a bass would go set up a bed, you know, because that's what you're doing. You're coming back through this thing and you're looking for these fish that are bedding. You're looking for the actual bedding fish. You got to make sure you cover that. And then in between those areas, then you want to drag real slow in that grass or or on that bank and just drag along and hopefully hit a rock or a stump because you can't see a lot of stuff, you know. Maybe you can, maybe you can see it on your on your graph, your, your 360, you might see a stump on a, on a drop or something, like on a little little easy bank coming in. You can line up and throw your bait on there and jig it real slow and drag it real slow around that stump. Use your electronics for that That when you come back through. Uh, you know, after you worked it up with a crankbait and a, and a chatterbait and you come back through it, pick it apart where you think fish are spawning and then dragging and looking and trying to find that little different thing that that fish might set up on and that maybe maybe you'll catch those those spawning fish yeah a lot of times in that scenario what i like to do is you know obviously worked my way in felt good about slowing down picking apart the cover and then you get onto that that kind of nothing bank which I love, right? And if it's a bigger stretch of nothing bank for a little while, one of the things I like to do, and because you brought up a very specific scenario, is I love to pick up a lipless crankbait, and I love to grind the nose in that bottom. And I'm only talking about a couple casts, mm -hmm. just up through there a little bit, you know, to my next piece of cover. And a lot of times that one, two punch, you know, um, it's actually a one, two, three punch. Cause we, we found them on a, on a, you know, a, a, another bait. We reworking them with that one, two punch of say the jig and the lipless, you know, like a, like a red, a red trap, for example, or, or something that's going to fit that dirty water environment and that spring, it's hard to beat red. Um, that is a such a effective, you know, you're on the right kind of bottom. You're in the right kind of area. You've had a couple of bites. You know the fish are there. How do you efficiently cover that water? And that can be, so I always have that lipless bait laying on the deck. I don't want to have to stop and open up the rod locker and dig it out. Yep. You know, when I get when I get the boat in the morning and I get there, I'm gonna lay that square bill up there, I'm gonna lay that chatterbait up there, I'm gonna lay that spinnerbait up there, I'm gonna lay that trap up there, I'm gonna lay that big mop jig up there, and I'm gonna lay my Texas rig up there with my creature bait. One and thing that's what I'm gonna do. Yeah, and and one thing to uh, uh, understand, and it's something you can forget so easy, and, and, and it happens to all of us in dirty water. There if if none of that stuff's working for you and you made that you, you know you just don't know what's going on and and it happens you know and it's so fresh in my mind you know you, you know you have an idea of what should work and you go do it and that doesn't work and then you you know you 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 worked your baits up fast 
you know, you're looking for your search bait. You're trying to get some kind of hints. You're really trying to do something. You go to another cut or cove and you start out in the front and you work that back and you're really working the different types of covers. You find some grass, you fish the grass real hard and you're just not getting uh, a bite to tell you where these fish are. Sometimes, George, you just got to slow down big time. You just got to slow it down. And it's so easy in dirty water to just fish too fast, trying to find out where the fish are, where the whole time they're just laying there and you just didn't slow down enough. And it's really easy to do in dirty water. That's why I like to drag that mop jig around. Exactly. The mop jig, you know, the drag that thing and really slow down. But there's times where you just got to, you just got to stop and slow down and really spend some time at it. And, and that time just isn't going to be a 10, 15 minute deal. You might have to spend it an hour or so of just dragging all the different types of truck of cover to really figure out, you know, what these fish really want, you know, especially in that dirty water. So, you know, just, just something that I like to tell, I, I, cause I'm, I'm guilty. I am really, really guilty of, of it. And, and, it, and, it, and it really, It'll really hurt you if you don't slow down and just get on there and drag your drag. Yeah. I mean, you know, muddy water can be I, like, for example, once fish have accustomed to it, I, I seek out dirty water. I like dirty water. Um, but when it's fresh, you got to take these strategies that we highlighted, mm -hmm. but you know, a couple days, a week go by. Your this the, this weather event continues. The water stays dirty. Whatever the case may be, totally different. I like it. It's totally different. I like it. I think it gives you an advantage. Absolutely. Plus, the fish the, the get a lot more aggressive. Yeah, they do. The they chat. get a lot more aggressive. They've yeah. gotten they've 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 become accustomed to their environment. Mm -hmm. And Not they so spooky. They're they're a they're <clears throat> a predator by heart, mm -hmm. and they're taking advantage of the situation. Yep. Yep. Um, that's where you're going to see the chatterbait really working for you. You know, that's where you're going to see these crankbaits just tearing it up for you. Um, so, you know, that's the, I guess that's another great point that you got to keep in mind is how long has it been muddy? Did it just turn muddy? Has it been muddy for a week? Has it been muddy for uh, a week and a half, two weeks? You know, uh, at what phase is this mud, mud all about? Because everybody says dirty water, you go shallow. And that's not necessarily true on fresh, dirty water. You know, uh, you think it is, but it might take a day or so for that, for those fish to kind of get acclimated to it and then move shallow and take advantage of that uh, as predators do. Uh, and then that's where that's all going to start happening. So just if you're not getting the bites and you're not, and things aren't happening, then you may have to slow down. But man, I'm telling you, once it does get right, it, dirty water fishing can be a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And, and, um, it can be, and it can be, uh, uh, you know, better than, than, than days on a lake that's when it's clear, really, honestly. Yeah, that's pretty much all I got on that topic. But river fishing, George, in muddy water is different than, is much different than lake fishing. And, um, I think, uh, dirty water for the spawn, um, hurts the spawn on the river, but it, 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 you know, it, it does clean up quick in those creeks and those, where those fish are going. And, um, and, and, and it happens a lot quicker overall that, that that's a, that's a big thing. So guys can really find, um, after a high dirty water scenario on a river, you can, well, you can, I will say one thing that's a little different than that. A free flowing river is a tidal river. A tidal river can take a long time to clean up. Well, I, I realize that. The I'm, main stem. Yeah, I'm talking about a free-flowing river. You know, you know, to me, a uh, muddy water scenario on a free-flowing river is, I mean, I love it. I absolutely love it. Higher, moving, faster water, you know, when it's, when it's coming up and it's the spawn and those fish that are kind of staging out front, they get pushed up into those spawning areas uh really fast and and faster than they wanted to and, and then what happens is a thing called stacking those fish just stack up and you'll have your 
uh, that all of a sudden your mud lines come into play. You know, I heard some, I seen somebody talking about fishing the mud lines. Well, on rivers, your mud lines play much more so, uh, and much quicker and almost like a structure, almost like a, 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 a type of cover that they use that mud line, uh, for the, especially the fish that are kind of moving in to spawn. They're not right, right ready to you. They're still kind of, they got pushed in by the high water and the dirty water kind of pushed them in those creeks. Man, you can fish those mud lines and absolutely smash them, you know, with uh, with moving baits and, and you know, all kinds of different baits. It's kind of, it, it becomes, e it, it, I don't want to say, say it like that, but it does start to become easy when you get these high water events because it stacks those fish in there. And that's where you start hearing guys say, man, I sat in one spot and I caught 25 fish. Well, high, muddy, dirty water does that on a river. So it, it's a lot different. Um, and I think on a lake, it takes that couple of days for those fish to acclimate to where you get that type of bite, you know, because we like that dirty water, but it had, the fish has, has to acclimate to it. Um, so keep that in mind, uh, big time, but I tell you, give me a high dirty river. I'm going to, I'm going to show you something, George. No doubt. Um, I'm changing some gears here on you. Go ahead. Shift away. I was reading my Bass Blaster email, emailer from Bass Blaster. Yeah. Which I really like his work. And way back in the back of it, he had a, a, a note on a record monkey face prickleback fish, which I'll tell you, I, I, I haven't been following the monkey back prickle face fish for a while. <laughs> the monkey face prickleback fish. For a while i haven't really looked in on that record i knew it was set in in oregon like you know several years ago i didn't realize it was broken my gosh there is now a new monkey face prickleback fish record in oregon caught on uh, i believe it was easter sunday woman caught it on a little sand crab four pound and a half four pounds and a half yep. four and a half pounds Monkey face prickleback fish. What the hell is that? Well, is it a saltwater fish? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Looks like an eel, or it looks like a a big eel with a monkey face. Really? So it's called a monkey face prickleback fish, and there's a new record. So congratulations to her. Four and a half pounder. Yeah. Damn it. She said I went there for something to eat. So guess what we have for dinner? <laughs> she ate it. Monkey back prickle face fish sandwiches for everybody. Oh my god. <laughs> What, she go get it weighed first and measured up and everything? Oh, yeah, she knew it was a record. Oh, got her got her certificate? She she remembered the previous record being set. She said fishing's her passion, and she was well aware of the monkey face prickleback fish. So, you know, one thing I haven't really heard a lot of is, is like, uh, a lot of talk about, you know, record fish. That you always start hearing it about this time of year. Stand by, I'm about to go out this weekend. <laughs> You know what I mean? You hear, you hear like this time of year, you start hearing about, oh, this record gut was broken. You know, the Texas record, you know, was broken or the California record was broken or, or not broken, but, you know, tested, always tested. You know what I mean? I just haven't really heard anything awesome about, you know, big, awesome fish being caught. Well, close to record. I, stuff. I can't really comment on that. You know, there's always something, even with all social media, you'd think you'd see something, you know, yeah. around. Well, I got news for you. The uh, monkey back prickle face record has been shattered. Okay. So there you heard a one. That's awesome. I like it. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I mean. Take us home, Mayor Mikey. I boy. hope you guys enjoyed the show. I uh, hope some of those tips on dirty water fishing helps you out. Uh, don't get frustrated with it. Yeah, it's frustrating, um, at, at times, but you know, dirty water when it's there for a little bit could be your friend. That's, that's what we figured out. And dirty water always has, uh, some clean water coming somewhere. So, you know, that mixture is, is something to look for. And the temperatures evolve with that. You know, you'll see some different warmer temperatures uh, from that. 
um look for you know look for that and in the river system i'm telling you embrace the high muddy water look for those creeks and stuff coming in those pipes like george is saying and those little um strips of strips of water that that fish will migrate to you know it's it's really can be amazing fishing if you just embrace dirty water fish the stuff that we talked about try it out slow down uh dig out those spawning fish because hey listen they're going to spawn anyway they're going to spawn anyway you're just going to get in there and slow it down and drag around and you will you will do very very good and you'll have maybe a, hopefully a new outlook in it but um anyway we will check you guys next time and we'll check you uh don't forget april 19th starts the buy-in for the sh for the uh tournament um so be ready for that that's coming up next friday Till next time, we'll catch you on the next Tackle Shop Live. The next day, you called me up. You told me I'm your little buttercup. You came over and you fell into my arms. Well, I know what I feel. Please tell me your love is real. You make me smile when I think of you. If I yell down low and I yell blue. Soaked in sweat, weird chills running down my neck. I'm going crazy from just the thought of you. A long blonde hair and your beautiful smile. Your sense of humor makes it all worthwhile. Don't make me wait, it's not a funny game. You know just what I feel. Please tell me I love is real. You make me.